hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our AI Research Student Conference organized by the Machine Learning and Data Analytics Lab here at the uh, MLDI at Triple E in Singapore. So today we are very fortunate to have with us uh, one of the international keynote speaker, Dr. Oren, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence, which this year has been named one of the number one most prestigious research institute. And he himself is also a professor at the University of Washington in the School of Computing. And on top of that, he also held many heads, such as a venture partner at the Moderna Venture Group. And he's also an entrepreneur, co-founder of various tech startup company. And he's an expert in the field of natural language processing and conquered the term machine reading and helped to create created the first commercial comparison shopping uh, agent. So without further ado, I would like to pass my time to Dr. Owen to actually share with us uh, on his take on AI. Thank so, uh, you. This... Yeah, uh, uh, thank you and thank you all for coming. I know it's uh, somewhat early on a, I guess, Saturday morning at your end. Yes. It's, yeah. Uh, the end of the day here uh, in Seattle on a Friday, so a bit of a compromise. Anyway, I'm going to give a brief talk and really want to leave time for questions and, uh, and discussion. And with that, let me find my slides here and share them. Okay, can everybody, can is it visible? Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes, you can see that. Oh, okay, excellent. So um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is I'll start with the big question that you might encounter as you're getting into this field. Uh, you might have thought about it, or certainly uh, I get asked about it a lot. Is AI good or evil? Are we, are we doing something bad by building AI systems? Then I, I hope to tell you a little bit about the Allen Institute for AI uh, in Seattle. Uh, we, uh, we hire folks from all over the world. We have uh, uh, interns and so on. So I hope uh, you'll consider it. And I want to tell you a little bit about Semantic Scholar. Even if you're not going to join us, I hope you uh, use Semantic Scholar. It's a pretty cool uh, engine and tool for doing your research. I'll talk a little bit about Cord19, which is a data set uh, we created uh, using Semantic Scholar to help uh, find answers to uh, scientific questions about COVID-19. And then I'll, I'll end with some thoughts about AI and science in the future. So let's start with the fact that for a lot of people, uh, AI evokes fear. And that's not a surprise when you have uh, influential folks like uh, Elon Musk saying that with AI, we're summoning the demon. Uh, that's, uh, that's scary stuff. On the other hand, you have folks like famous roboticist Rod Brooks saying, if you're worried about the Terminator, right, we've seen that movie, just keep the door closed because our robots actually struggle to open doors. And even if that robot eventually learns uh, to open that door using uh, reinforcement learning, well, it'll find there's a staircase behind the door and the robots struggle with the staircase. And then maybe succeeds in climbing the staircase, but there's the next challenge. Uh, and the one after that. So it's not a surprise that Andrew Ng said, working to prevent AI from turning evil is a little bit like disrupting the space program to prevent overpopulation on Mars. It ignores the fact that we haven't even landed a single person uh, on Mars. And uh, of course, uh, that's very technically challenging and we're already worried about overpopulation. And by the way, there's some good reasons perhaps to, to get people to Mars, right? There's uh, important potential benefits uh, in the long term. So we can argue back and forth on this question of uh, uh, is AI have the potential to destroy humanity uh, or not? And as a computer scientist, I, I believe in uh, empirical inquiry, not in a philosophical banding of intuitions and definitions of words. So in an article I wrote uh, about a year ago, I tried to say, can we think of this as a more empirical question? Can we identify um, lines that if AI crosses them, we say, okay, wow, now it's really gonna be uh, um, super intelligent or at least as intelligent as humans. 
And I called these uh, canaries in the coal mines of AI because miners would, uh, in the old days, put canaries out to see if the, if the oxygen level was dropping and the canary would keel over. So um, what, what would a, a, a canary like that look like? Uh, the first thing is to remember, and all of you working on machine learning, I think, uh, know this, that machine learning is still 99% uh, human work, right? We design the inputs, like the target concept that we want to learn. Uh, we uh, uh, input the data. We label the data. Uh, we come up with the algorithm or the architecture to use. Uh, we assess the uh, output. I have my uh, uh, shirt here. Uh, my overfitted uh, t-shirt, right, uh, to remind us that often we find overfitting and then we have to change regularization parameters and other things uh, to fix uh, the overfitting. And it's just a very labor uh, intensive process to get a machine learning program to work well. And most of that work is still uh, human work uh, that you or I uh, would, would do. And so really to say that uh, machines learn is a little bit like saying that uh, baby penguins fish. It's really the, the parent penguin who goes out and finds the fish and hunts them down and brings it back to the baby and then really uh, regurgitates tiny morsels uh, to the little baby penguin. So uh, this is important to keep in mind when we think about AI as a, as a scary entity. And so um, I think a key thing to think about is can we build true machine learning, machine learning where the problem itself is automatically formulated and executed by, by the program, not uh, doing kind of the last mile of, of statistical learning. And this is reminiscent of a famous quote by uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, the, the artist. He said that uh, computers are useless. They only answer questions. And what he meant is that they don't ask questions, right? And of course, the basis of formulating a machine learning problem is you want to start with a question. What is it that, that you want to learn? And so this is all by way of saying that uh, AI is making great progress, but it's still very, very limited. So the bottom line of this part of the talk is that AI is a tool. It's not a being. It's not a creature. It's not something that's going to take over the world. It's a tool. And it's up to us, of course, to uh, employ this tool to, for the benefit of humanity. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, the late Paul Allen, who was the co-founder of Microsoft, uh, founded the uh, AI2, as we call ourselves, the Allen Institute for AI. It's a nonprofit research institute. He founded it in 2014. Our mission is AI for the common good, using AI uh, to make the world a better place. Uh, over the last seven years, we've become a leader in computer vision, natural language processing research, and also in deep learning. We've published more than uh, 400 papers in uh, top conferences. We've gotten more than 10 best paper awards. And uh, we have more than 100, actually by now 120 uh, AI PhDs, researchers, and engineers. And as I mentioned, uh, we're hiring. Um, so um, uh, please keep that in mind uh, for the future. Uh, to give you a sense of what are the projects that we do, I thought I'd just kind of uh, say a few words about each and then focus more on, uh, on Semantic Scholar. And uh, I see there's a question in the chat, but uh, uh, I'm probably uh, um, best, uh, well, uh, well, I actually, I, I'm going to answer this one because it's such a great question, but then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll save the questions to the end. It's just easier uh, with, uh, with the interaction. So, um, so, uh, the question is, uh, what do you think about Elon Musk saying that we, we might be living in a, in a simulation? Um, you know, Elon Musk is clearly a, a brilliant guy and, you know, very successful, uh, in, in so many ways. I have to admit though, that like my, uh, 10 year old boy, he does sometimes seem a little bit hungry uh, for attention. So it seems like he'll opine on anything, whether it's, you know, people stuck in a, in a tunnel in uh, Thailand, if you remember, you know, the poor uh, people who were stuck there or, or about these things. So um, I, I don't take seriously his, his comments on fundamental philosophical questions. Uh, so I would say uh, that uh, there's just, 
uh, no evidence for that question. Again, going back to an empiricist, I would say, uh, what data is it for that? And of course, the answer to that, because it is a philosophical conundrum, is of course there's no data. It's a very, very good simulation. Uh, and uh, then I would say, well, if there's no data, and in fact, there's no hope of getting data, then, then what's the point, right? This is again, a question for philosophers. And it's fun to speculate on, particularly if you're Elon Musk, uh, but uh, it's not really a serious question. Uh, and then the, the, the next question uh, is, I guess, related to that. Maybe again, unbeknownst to us, we're um, uh, uh, an AI trained by a much smarter creature. And I think there's a sense again, in which, uh, well, we're a natural intelligence, but certainly evolution played a role in shaping us and shaping our minds. But I think uh, where I come back to is what's the difference? And I, I feel like I, I wanna focus my effort and my thinking on questions and problems that makes, make a difference. There was a famous poet who said, uh, if I could live my life over again, I would focus more on real problems and less on imaginary ones. So I think there's a lot of imaginary problems, but I want to I want to focus on on the real ones. And by the way, there's plenty of real problems with AI, right? Uh, issues around privacy, around fairness, around uh, impact on jobs. So uh, it's not like we lack of uh, things to think about. So with that, let me go back to AI2, which is focused on making uh, impact on the real world uh, under the assumption that there is a real world. And um, I'll just mention uh, these projects very briefly and happy to answer more questions. Uh, we have a project called Allen NLP, which does fundamental uh, NLP research, but also is the basis of an open source NLP research library built on PyTorch called Allen NLP. And uh, it's particularly well suited if you want to do uh, research. So I encourage you to check it out. It's completely free. Uh, Prior is our computer uh, vision team. We have a simulated robotic world. Uh, we have uh, Alan Act, which is again a, a, a library to use to interact with embodied agents uh, and a lot of results in computer vision. Uh, again, they're on our website. For example, we have a um, no-code computer vision explorer. So if you want to test state-of-the-art algorithms on uh, your images in various vision tasks, all you have to do is upload the image and you'll see the response, which can be very informative if you're playing around with uh, research or trying to understand the state-of-the-art. Um, one of our most exciting um, projects is the Mosaic project which is a project to try to endow computers with common sense. So all of us know that, uh, you know, I can put a, a basketball through a door, but I would have a hard time uh, putting a jumbo 747 jet through the door. But um, uh, the computers don't necessarily know that. Or, you know, we know that uh, it's not polite to call somebody at three in the morning usually, but how would a computer know that? So how do we endow computers with common sense using modern AI techniques like uh, crowdsourcing, machine learning, and so on? Again, it's, uh, uh, this is a project led by uh, Yejin Choi, who shares her time between uh, the University of Washington and AI2. We also have an incubator. That's another actually 100 people who are very active uh, building AI-based startup. This is an AI-first incubator where we start by asking ourselves, OK, how can we build um, uh, AI companies that, that have a positive difference in the world. And for example, one company is called uh, Well Said Labs. It has the state-of-the-art um, text-to-speech system where you can uh, use it to generate custom voices of various sorts. And people who are building computer games and uh, e-learning and advertising uh, use that. But also, uh, for example, people have used it who have a hard time speaking and don't want to sound like Stephen Hawking with a rather um, mechanical voice. And so uh, this company also helps people with uh, severe speech difficulties uh, effectively find uh, their own voice. And probably our largest project is uh, Semantic Scholar, and I'll talk, I'll talk more about that uh, in, in a minute. Uh, I, I neglected to mention Aristo, which is a very famous project of ours where we set the goal 
of uh, building a computer program that will answer science questions, uh, the kind that you find on a test. And our goal was not to um, help people cheat on uh, science tests, but rather these problems often involve not just knowledge and not just common sense, but reasoning and question understanding and ways to go beyond just simple textual tasks. Uh, and so uh, Aristo is our project uh, to think about um, reasoning, <clears throat> uh, particularly over uh, textual information. So let's talk about semantic scholar. I always like to start with the problem. And the problem is that we all suffer from uh, uh, information overload. Um, we have too many tweets, too many email messages, Facebook posts, Slack messages, it's just endless. Well, academics have all that. And there's uh, roughly 8 million new papers published each year. And uh, our studies show that even the more diligent scientists really read on the order of 200 papers per year. So there's a huge mismatch there and you really need to find the right papers to read uh, and so on. And so the idea of Semantic Scholar was to help with that information overload, to help you cut through the clutter and home in on key papers, citations and results. Uh, we started the project in uh, 2015 and over time it's grown to more than 8 million users a month. A lot of them come from outside the United States uh, and we started with computer science, but now we have 190 million papers that cover all, um, all academic uh, disciplines, uh, which is pretty exciting. The, the basics of Semantic Scholar is that we take the PDFs uh, and map it to a literature graph where the nodes uh, may be uh, authors <coughs> or papers or topics. And then of course, uh, that's searchable using uh, keywords like Google Scholar or other engines, but also using all kinds of metadata. We also compute uh, author homepages automatically. So if you've authored some papers, you should check it out. You might find that there's a, already an author homepage for you. And not only um, uh, do we have the author pages with the list of papers, but we have as shown here, uh, influence diagrams. So we can see which authors uh, strongly influenced John Kleinberg and who did he influence. And then again, that's a very, nice way to navigate if you're trying to learn a field and who influenced who. In addition to these um, graphs and these uh, author homepages, we also have paper detail pages. Think of this as a Wikipedia for scientific papers. And these paper detail pages, we have uh, the PDF if you want to read the paper, but to help you decide whether you want to read it, we have uh, automatically extracted figures and tables and references. We'll link to software and GitHub that's associated with the paper, slide decks uh, when they're available so you can glance at them to see if you wanna read the paper, uh, blog posts about the paper, videos, news articles, all these help you figure out this decision. Is this gonna be one of the 200 papers that I uh, end up reading this year? We also compute uh, all kinds of interesting uh, citation metrics. Uh, we, we look at not just uh, how many papers were cited, but we compute a, a semantic uh, notion of citations that is uh, actually much more challenging. So you might have a paper that's been cited a thousand times, but semantic citations would typically be only a hundred. So you have a lot fewer look through. And the way we get these is first of all, we exclude self citations when an author uh, cites him or herself. Uh, we exclude incidental citations where yeah, the paper cites you know, you, your paper is mentioned somewhere, but it's not really uh, a serious influence. And most importantly, we have a machine learned model that looks at two papers and based on the text, uh, tries to understand the uh, relationships between them. And there's a lot more to say here about citation metrics, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll continue again so we can get to uh, uh, question and answer. So if you think about all, all these features, there, there, and there's lots more that I haven't mentioned, uh, it can be overwhelming. And so we try to uh, identify a model of how do people engage uh, with scientific papers. And if you think about it, there are three main steps. First, you discover a paper, which you may do via social media, like somebody tweeted about it, or maybe somebody emailed you about it. You can do, of course, using search, whether it's Google or Semantic Scholar, and you can also uh, browse. Maybe you're browsing a conference proceedings and uh, you come across a paper that you wanna read. Uh, and so uh, in uh, Semantic Scholar, 
In addition to those, we've built effectively a recommendation engine for, for papers. So think about it, right? If you go to Netflix, uh, it'll recommend movies to you based on the ones you've seen. If you go to Amazon, it'll recommend um, products to you based on the um, uh, products you've bought. Well, uh, but there hasn't really been recommendation engines for academia. So we've built uh, an adaptive feed that allows you to label a few papers as uh, I like this or not. And then it'll uh, constantly recommend to you new papers that come out that you might be interested in. And if you set it up correctly, it'll alert you. So this can be very handy. Some people are trying to keep up with the latest and greatest research, uh, but it's almost impossible to keep up in uh, a field like AI that's expanding so rapidly. And so if you uh, set up the research feed, it'll automatically uh, attempt to figure out what papers are particularly interesting to you. And of course, it'll keep getting better if you label the papers as I like this one, uh, I don't like that one. The second step is once you've discovered uh, a paper from our adaptive feed or whichever way, you have a decision to make. Do I ignore it? Do I skim it, which we often do? Or um, do I actually read it, which uh, as I said, we do a few, uh, very few. And um, in Semantic Scholar, we have a lot of work to help you make that decision. Uh, obviously, there's the abstracts, but we highlight key sentences in the abstracts. If you don't want to look at the figures and tables, these are automatically extracted. You can look through them. If you want to navigate the citation graph, we uh, filter, as I mentioned, incidental citations. We sort citations by most influential uh, to least influential. We show you excerpts. If you're curious what was said about a particular paper, we do that. And we've even created uh, TLDRs. These are automatically generated single sentence summary of the paper. It's particularly handy, for example, if you take a mobile device like this phone, uh, you go to the Semantic Scholar page, you do a search, you'll get a list of papers and you'll see that uh, each paper has a kind of a one sentence summary and they're often quite useful in deciding, hey, do I wanna read uh, this paper or not? And um, the way we did this, again, not going into a lot of technical detail, but uh, um, many of you may have heard about the new uh, generative models like uh, GPT-3 and others that are very commonly used in uh, natural language processing and in computer vision. Well, we, we built a, um, uh, um, a, uh, a generative model uh, to support that, but it's a generative language model for scientific summarization. And here's an example from a uh, quite famous paper from 2017 about attention. Uh, you can read the abstract, you can read the paper. RTLDR says, we use a 2D matrix to represent the embedding with each row of the matrix attending on a different part of the sentence. So uh, again, that turns out to be quite a nice um, single sentence summary of, of what's going on uh, in, in this paper. So that's, that's a lot of fun uh, to, to play with. So um, again, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the demo. That can take uh, 15 minutes and so on, but happy to answer questions. And obviously, as you can tell, I'm excited about Semantic Scholar. Check it out. Send me email if you have uh, feature requests. Send us feedback. We actually have customer service people who read every uh, email feedback. Sometimes there are errors in the data. Sometimes we're very interested in your, in your feedback. And then uh, the last layer uh, about reading the paper, uh, actually we, we've um, uh, created a, a project joint with Marty Hurst, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, to create an interactive reading application that uh, explains to you uh, the mathematical uh, symbols in the paper, allows you to navigate the citations and so on. And uh, we've released, I think, a, an alpha version of this and we're about to go uh, much broader. So uh, the idea here is that uh, when you're reading a paper, you really don't get a lot of support. Uh, it's a PDF file. You can print it and read it offline or you can read it online. But if you think about it, there's a tremendous potential uh, to show you uh, where is this mathematical symbol used? Where is it defined? Uh, and just help you navigate the paper uh, a lot more uh, effectively. And again, I'll. I'll skip this demo in the interest of time. You know, just to get a little bit more technical, um, let me mention some of the work under the hood uh, to do all this. So 
if you think about traditional work in NLP, and I'm not talking about uh, 20 years ago or even 1956, but really uh, uh, even the work uh, in the last you know, few years, it's really focused on sentences. We parse sentences, we translate sentences from one uh, language to another, we extract key facts from sentences. And to do the work that we do with NLP and Semantic Scholar, we really have to scale this to document level NLP where we uh, work on the full uh, document. So uh, as an example, uh, a typical context that's used in systems like BERT is pretty short. It would typically be uh, the sentence or maybe a few sentences. And we've built uh, the ability in Semantic Scholar to make the full uh, context, uh, sorry, to make the context uh, a lot longer. So we've gone from a maximum of 512 tokens or words in BERT to uh, 32,000 tokens in Longformer, uh, which is an open source system that, that uh, we developed. And what that allows you to do is really include the, the full, a full academic paper as context. And with these richer contexts, uh, we're able to do a better job uh, answering questions over documents, summarizing them, uh, and so on. And um, the, the essential insight here, again, I'm just touching on it, you can go to the long former paper, which you can find using Semantic Scholar, but basically the attention matrix that's typically used is an N by N matrix, so it's an N squared uh, operation. And we figured out by uh, um, looking at a subset of the matrix, you see here it's, it's a sliding window, but with some additional global information and some dilations, uh, but the net effect is that it's linear. Uh, and so because it's linear in N, right, the, the um, width or height of the matrix, uh, we can do a lot more than with a quadratic system. Um, scientific documents also have special structure and we're building that into our model. We've released uh, language models, for example, Cybert, that are specific for scientific text. So really, if you think about the work on in NLP, there's been so much with tweets and uh, other things. Uh, we think that science is is uh, is very important source of of text. And really, um, uh, uh, to go to go further, uh, we we were challenged to um, create a body of scientific papers that's machine readable uh, for COVID nineteen. And this was in March of 2020, so quite early in the epidemic. The White House contacted us through a colleague and said, can you take all the papers that you have and all the papers you can find and build them in a machine readable format so that others can build uh, question answering systems and um, uh, search systems and visualization systems to try and get information about COVID-19. And the reason they reached out to us is because they knew we were in the business of building these literature graphs with Semantic Scholar. And I'm really proud of our team within five days uh, they were able They create the first version of Core 19. And within 10 days, this was released as a free source to the public. A lot of uh, publishers and preprints um, uh, servers like BioArchive and MedArchive joined. Uh, we got information from NIH. We, we had a lot of partners. And uh, this was announced with 24,000 papers on uh, coronavirus and SARS and things like that uh, in, uh, in 2020. Uh, currently, there's more than 200,000 papers uh, in this corpus. It's updated daily. Uh, not only is the text machine readable, but we also put in capabilities to read tables. We found that often uh, result tables uh, contain uh, key information that, that scientists want. want. And uh, Kaggle, which is now part of Google, um, uh, uh, did a competition uh, they listed a set of questions and they asked people to build AI systems to help answer these questions about COVID uh, using Core 19. And it became the most uh, popular Kaggle competition ever. Uh, millions of people uh, viewed our data, hundreds of thousands of downloads and uh, many participants from uh, all, over, all over the world. Let me just show you um, uh, a few, maybe a, a couple of examples, AWS, created a, a search engine that you could ask questions like um, how prevalent are antibodies in saliva or I, are IL-6 inhibitors key to COVID-19? 
uh, a lot of key questions here. Here's an example, a snapshot of a system out of uh, um, Korea University where you ask what temperature kills HCoV-19 and it's able to highlight, hopefully you can see the answer, 56 degrees Celsius. It gives you the context for the answer. And of course you can click through and read the paper. And um, there's a wide variety of, of, uh, of systems. I won't go through all of them. Uh, claim verification, visualization systems that allow you to see results in a graph like this. This is a visualization system that we built that shows you different groups working on different topics and the uh, connections between them. By the way, all these systems are publicly available. I'm, I'm going through them quickly. This one, for example, is called SciSite, and you can find it on our, uh, on our website. Um, our, our vision here, uh, even going beyond uh, COVID-19 and COVID-19, is to really try and connect the AI community and different medical uh, communities. And there's a quote here from a clinical researcher just talking about how they, again, are overwhelmed with the data and how uh, they really want uh, AI systems to, uh, to help them. A whole bunch of articles came out uh, citing COVID-19 or using data that they got from it. So we're, we're pretty proud of, um, of the work there. And our vision really goes way beyond that. Uh, what we imagine is that you would be able in the future, and this is very ambitious, but you'd be able to do scientific discovery uh, using uh, tools like Semantic Scholar. So imagine if a cure for some intractable cancer uh, is hidden in these uh, thousands of papers and clinical studies and what have you. Uh, you don't have time to read them all. We know that, even if you're a, a very dedicated clinician. So can a, an AI-based discovery engine try to read those and uh, suggest hypotheses to you that you might uh, investigate? We, we think that um, in the future, this is in the far future, AI-based discovery engines are gonna be key to finding answers to science's uh, thorniest problems, not just in medicine. Uh, we have a lot of problems with climate change, with, uh, uh, with uh, anticipating earthquakes in uh, so many, so many ways. So, so with that, I want to go back to the very beginning of my talk where I, I said um, uh, that uh, AI raises all these, these issues, right? The issues of privacy and fairness, all these challenges. But I want to go back to the question of, is it poised uh, to destroy humanity as folks like Elon Musk and also um, uh, Nick Bostrom and others have argued? And my answer to that is, it's quite the opposite. We see, we see so many opportunities to save lives using AI. Think, for example, about self-driving cars. There's still a ways off, but the potential there is to save lives, to save uh, pedestrians, motorcyclists, uh, to reduce car accidents. In the United States, there's over 40,000 highway deaths each year on our, on our roads and highways. And the studies show that the kind of safety systems we can build with AI could cut maybe 80% of those. And we're not even talking about the injuries and so on. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's no surprise that my colleague Eric Horvitz has a great line of this. He says, it's not that AI will kill, kill people, it's the absence of AI technologies that is already killing people, right? We don't have the AI in the cars yet and, and we need that. And of course, the same is true with, uh, with medicine and so many other things. So with that, I'll stop uh, more or less on time. Thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, shall I go to the chat? To uh, read yeah, I would, I would just go ahead and get uh, lead, lead along the question answer. So first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Oren, for sharing with us on Semantic Scholar and what you guys are doing at Ellen AI. Uh, I really love the shirt, the overfitting shirt. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, OK, so we have quite a number of questions that Chen came in. And uh, maybe we can you, you can take some time to address some of these. So I think one of the questions that was quite interesting, I think, is that some of some of them uh, are asking that we, because we know that Ellen AI is actually one of the top uh, prestigious research institute. So how do Ellen AI differ from what people are trying to do in DeepMind and Open AI? Is there a line that's drawn between what you guys are doing at Ellen AI? Yeah, there is a difference. So first of all. 
absolutely um you know i'm you, it's kind of you to say you know deep mind is a terrific organization i have uh, friends there colleagues there we have some students who are here who are now uh, working there and of course the same is true with open ai i would say that there are two big differences one is we're the only one of those organizations that's a nonprofit. Uh, open ai was nonprofit, but they became, I sometimes joke, I call them closed AI, right? They became, uh, right, they took a billion dollars from Microsoft and they need to um, generate a return on capital. So they're more secretive than they used to be. And all these places uh, publish, but, you know, it's, it's in a corporate context. So again, uh, there's nothing wrong with corporate context, but uh, as a nonprofit, we have a more freedom and more focus on things that uh, will benefit uh, humankind. The second difference I would say is often in a big organization, uh, your ideas can kind of get lost in the maelstrom. You're kind of a very small cog in a big machine. And we're a much smaller place. And so we're more uh, flexible, we're more informal. Uh, you know, when uh, COVID came, a lot of big places canceled their internship programs. And we said, no, we're gonna figure out how to make this work. And you can even stay at home in Singapore or where have you, and we'll do remote internships. So, so I think there's a, sometimes an advantage, uh, or, or this is certainly a big difference, of uh, being in a smaller, more uh, informal place. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ron. Uh, so I think hopefully that answers our participants' question. Uh, and sorry about the background, it's raining heavily here. Okay, uh, so maybe the next question I think our participants have is that, uh, what do you think about AI in terms of helping governance? So we know that AI uh, has been a huge topic in terms of or topic of AI for good, AI ethics, or AI sustainability. So in terms of AI governance, how do you think that that can help in tackling some of the problems that arise due to the pandemic? From, from your point of view, of course. Yeah. So so that's a, a you know a wonderful question. There, uh, I enjoy all of them, but uh, I, um, I I I think that the um what ai is really good at sometimes is driving the cost of something way down right so let's take a medicine right uh there's a lot of places where they can't afford a doctor right and even in you know rural rural sections of the united states i think it's going to be a long time before an automated doctor is anywhere near as good as a as a human doctor but if you don't have any then uh, AI systems, right, uh, could really help. So I think that uh, driving the cost down and then making that technology more broadly available uh, is a big deal. And let me give you two examples of projects I didn't mention because they're uh, we're actually in the process of transferring them into AI2. They're gonna be part of AI2 um, in September, but they're exactly like that. So one project is called Earth Ranger, and it's, it's a project for people with national with wildlife uh, to report uh, poaching incidents and um, uh, uh, challenges like an animal being sick and things like that so that people in the park service can help just do a better job taking care of rare animals like rhinos or elephants uh, better. Well, we built it here, we made it freely available and it's widely used in Africa, right? So that's an example where uh, uh, well, this is software, but we're layering AI on top of it. Another system is called Skylight, and it looks at illegal fishing. And there are many, many poor countries where there's uh, illegal fishing uh, depleting their stock, their food supply uh, on their shores. And they don't have the resources that, say, the United States has with Navy and satellites and radars and so on. So we've built uh, AI systems that even based on quite limited data from ship transponders and so on, is able to identify uh, boats or ships that look like they're engaged in illegal fishing. And then the country's Coast Guard can investigate. So again, um, this is an example of a kind of automation, right, that drives the cost of uh, policing your, your shores and your, um, your seas for fishing uh, a, lot, a lot better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us uh, your thoughts on that. I think uh, definitely that will actually help in terms of AI sustainability and cut down the la labor costs. And also, I think one of the questions that our participants have, I think it's quite relevant to what 
you guys are doing in LNAI is that how far do you think we are away from you know equipping AI system with the kind of common sense similar to human? So I'm aware that you guys does a lot of research on common sense reasoning. Uh, so what, what, what's your thoughts on that area? <laughs> so I think that common sense is definitely one of the uh, most difficult uh, frontiers. Uh, and in part is because part of common sense is very embodied. Like for example, when I approach a door and it has a certain kind of handle, I know that I have to turn the handle and then kind of move back uh, to let the door open and then I can step out of the room. But I know that from my experience with my body and I don't even think about it, how's a computer supposed to know that? Same with social interactions. There's all kinds of things you know, if I know if I'd say this, probably people will laugh. If I say this, they might get upset with me. This is really inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, how do I know this? I know this from, from history. So it's a huge challenge uh, because computers have different experiences than us uh, to build common sense uh, into the machine. That's first. The second thing is this is kind of a segue to talking about this other broad issue, which is you know, uh, there's been a proliferation of leaderboards in AI and computer vision and in, in um, machine learning and in, in natural language. And often we find that we can train systems to do really well on the leaderboard on this very narrow task. But then when we ask them things that are close to that or related to that, they actually do a terrible job. Uh, a great example of that is GPT-3 actually, which uh, does an amazing job answering questions. But then if you rephrase the question, or you ask it a related question, it can do terribly. Like um, you might ask it, I don't know, who's the president of the United States in 1824? And it'll do a great job answering that question. And then you ask it, do, do United States have a president in 1824? And the answer is, of course, yes. If you know who the president is, then you know that you had a president then. And it'll say, no, or I don't know. That, that's a hypothetical example, but there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies there that show that sometimes we can answer questions or we can produce sort of remarkable behavior, but we don't really understand what's going on. And common sense is all about, quote unquote, really understanding what's going on. So the answer is a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adler. I think, uh, of course, we can be optimistic about it. I think over time, we'll show that. Uh, I think for the next question, uh, I, I have to confess a bit about myself. Actually, I'm also a researcher in the field of embodied AI. I have published uh, one or two papers using the Ellen, Ellen 2 talk uh, as, as one of the foundation to my work. So I think my next question comes from me, myself, and that is, what do you think is the future of embodied AI? Do you think that from Ellen Institute's point of view, do you think that you guys are actually moving towards a, a AGI or artificial general intelligence through the form of embodied AI? Or what is the end goal that you guys are looking for? Well, Again, the, the end goal is, is very far away. Maybe something that I can say that's more relevant is what's happening currently. So we just released a new version of Thor as you might be aware of, uh, or I'm sure you're yeah. aware of it, that has a robotic arm. We also had major efforts. So, so basically, right, the work in embodied AI, uh, a lot of it is in simulation, right? Because uh, that's just much more convenient. You can work a lot faster, more efficiently. A big problem with simulation is a, they're still not realistic. That's why we added the arm and we continue to make them more uh, realistic. But still, even if it works in simulation, will it work in the real world? So I think uh, a big trend, and we've uh, focusing on that at AI too, again, COVID kind of uh, slowed us down, but is what's called sim to real, right? Going from <clears throat> uh, how can you take something that say was trained in a simulation and get it to work as quickly as possible uh, in the real world, maybe with just some fine tuning of the models. So I would say that's the case. As far as AGI, you know, can we build a, a human baby or, you know, toddler and kind of, uh, you know, really get at this kind of dream that got many of us, you know, into the field, you know, I'm fascinated by AGI, but having spent, you know, 30 years in the field, um, no, we're, 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 we're not even working on that. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think Robot Hall was one of the examples of sim to real that you guys are doing. Uh, and also I think the next question from our participant is that, uh, to what extent do you think that AI can help to boost efficiency for manufacturing process? 
and or even help with future technology in terms of manufacturing process. So I guess this participant come from more of an industry point of view. Right. So I, I think there's a huge potential there. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think uh, Andrew Ng has led uh, efforts uh, in, in that direction. The thing to remember is that <clears throat> in manufacturing, um, the um, computer vision can be super helpful if you want to uh, um, uh, look at parts and you know, uh, detect uh, quality. Uh, computer vision can be helpful in terms of monitoring for safety violations. If people are too close together, if there's a danger, just as a simple example uh, from the construction industry, right? People are supposed to wear their, wear their hard hats, right? To protect themselves. They don't always do that. Very easy to build a uh, camera and a vision algorithm that's constantly monitoring that. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. When it comes to um, manual dexterity, Obviously, that's harder. We're still, we you know, the hand is really a remarkable instrument. And uh, for example, Amazon has highly instrumented its um, warehouses with Kiva Robotics, right? A company they acquired. So the warehouse, it's not manufacturing, it's distribution, but it's very much dealing with physical uh, things and putting together packages to send out. It's highly roboticized, except for the gripping piece. There's still, um, uh, hard at work on automating that. The one other thing I would say is that, uh, of course, there's already been success in robotics and so on, but the way the manufacturing has changed to be much more agile and reconfigurable is still very, very hard for, for our machines. So uh, I think that there's room for um, AI in manufacturing to help us be more productive and be safer and produce a higher quality pro, uh, pro, product. But I don't think that AI is gonna be replacing people in manufacturing for a, for a very long time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Oren. So I think uh, we, we have time for one last question. I think this is a relatively interesting question. I think uh, you're a good person to ask that question. So we are aware that actually AI has went through two winters due to re computational resources or data constraint. So do you think that that might be a third winter to come or are we actually approaching more of an AI sprint after this COVID has passed? Wow. Well, first of all, we are clearly uh, in an AI spring in the sense that really since uh, Lisa Dahl was defeated right by AlphaGo, many countries have created national AI programs, certainly Singapore has, and uh, a high quality one and put, you know, billions and billions of dollars of funding into it. Uh, you know, China has, has done that, the US is responding. And so we are in the AI spring. So what will cause uh, an AI winter? And I see two possibilities. And, and the questioner is right, these things have been quite cyclical. One possibility is that, again, people will get uh, overly excited. That's what happened in the past about the abilities of AI. You see these amazing demos and so on, and you think, wow, okay, manufacturing will be revolutionized. Healthcare, we're gonna have self-driving cars. We're gonna have um, you know, automated doctors in every, you know, uh, every place there's internet. And for example, with uh, autonomous cars, we thought they were gonna be here now. Elon Musk uh, said so. He said there'd be a car to drive um, you know, automatically from New York to California. And uh, it's just not true. Uh, we, we don't have that. It turns out that some of the problems are harder than we expected. So when we have hype and uh, too much optimism, that causes a, a winter. The second thing that would cause a winter is that AI is very much now permeating military systems, right? So there's increasingly intelligent uh, weapon systems. And by the way, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because those can save lives, but there's also increasingly autonomous weapon systems. And that is very scary, right? There's so many decisions to be made in the battlefield and to be made with huge amount of data very, very fast. It's tempting for the commanders to relegate more and more decisions to the machines. And I think that if we have uh, increasing militarization of AI and that in turn uh, backfires, uh, you know, killing a lot of people due to AI errors and uh, having you know, increasingly vicious, violent conflicts, uh, I think that, um, you know, 
might also cause us to really hit the pause and think about what we do. So I hope we don't get to uh, either of those circumstances and instead we uh, stay realistic, uh, stay in the use of AI for good things rather than for uh, killing people. And uh, with that, I wanna thank you very much for, uh, for joining me and Gwen, thank you for uh, hosting me, inviting me and leading the discussion. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Oran. And thank you to all the participants that joined us today at such early in the morning. And we really hope to see you, uh, continue to see you throughout our conference. And thank you, Dr. Oran, for joining us and spending our, yeah, your time with us to answer some of the questions that our participants have. And it was really an enriching uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.